there's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. Like, oh my God, I totally have the most bitchin' guest today. In the early years of her career, the breakthrough film of today's guest was the 1983 independently produced movie. Can you guess? Yep, it was Valley Girl. Martha Coolidge has enjoyed an award-winning career in the entertainment industry that has spanned five decades. She has over 50 directing credits to her name, in addition to a few producing and writing credits. Among the 25 films she's directed are also Real Genius, The Wonderful Ramblin' Rose, which is where I think I met Martha, Introducing Dorothy Dandridge, Out to Sea, Angie, and The Prince and Me. Martha's 25 television series credits include episodes of Weeds, Madam Secretary, CSI, Sex in the City, Leap Years, and The Twilight Zone. She's worked with an impressive list of actors from Halle Berry and Laura Dern and Michelle Williams to Robert Duvall, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, and Patrick Swayze. She also discovered talent, including Nicolas Cage, oh yeah, him, Val Kilmer, and James Gandolfini. Martha has been significantly awarded she gives back to the industry. She's an avid horsewoman, which I want to talk about. And she made history in 2001 when she was elected the first woman president of the Directors Guild of America. Martha, I am so happy to have you here today. <laughs> it's great. I feel very old now after <laughs> listening to that talk. <laughs> and did I mention I was at your wedding? Oh, no, you didn't. I was at your wedding. That's great. I was invited to your wedding to your wonderful husband, Jim who we shout out to Jim, who is an extraordinary production designer. Yes, he is. And you worked with him on... I met him, I, well, I first met him on Out to Sea. But since then, I think he did... Every, oh, I've every done movie. lots of movies with him. And television. And series. he's done, you know, yes, television, and he's come and helped on things. He's really fun. You know what I love about this industry, and Martha and I just saw each other coming up from the parking garage, and we were just introduced to Nigel Lithgow right outside the studio here, and he said, where do you know each other from? And we were both like, <laughs> I don't know where we met. And I think it was Dorothy Danridge, but it was definitely on a movie. Yeah, maybe it was Rambling Rose. Oh, or... I'm sorry, Rambling Rose, for sure. And I remember seeing that and saying, Oh, my God, this artist, this director is so extraordinary. <laughs> it was just so cutting edge at that moment in time and a beautifully crafted movie. Well, it's it, that's extraordinary because the script was actually quite old. Really? And had just been buried by people turning it down. And I, it came out of a library that somebody found and gave me the script and I couldn't believe that it hadn't been made. Who was that somebody? It was a development executive. Ah, so it was done at a studio? It was not, well, Coralco, but... Uh, Got it. Oh, Coralco. Or Carolco. Or, <laughs> or whoever, whatever you, you want to say pronounce it. it. Yeah. I have to say, that was Mario Casar and Andy Vine, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. God, they did a lot of movies. Yes, then. they did. Mostly and action fair, though, right? Yes, and this was quite different, and I... Gave it to Rennie, who was producing Rambling Rose at the time, and he wanted to direct it, but he said, I'd love to produce it. So Rennie's in my book, Rennie Harlan. Yeah. He's a terrific guy. Yeah, also. he is. So and that's an interesting fact. I didn't know that. He's a character. Indeed. Martha, you are, to me, the epitome of the great director. You're also known as the actress director. In my background as an actor, I have a great appreciation for people who love actors as love much actors. as you do. Yeah. Is can you speak to that why you have that reputation? I think that I have the reputation because I started out in high school acting and then directing. So I came out of sort of more of a theater background. In and Connecticut? I, in Connecticut. See, I know too I'd much worked. about you, so I have to be a better interviewer That's true. than usual. It was Connecticut <laughs> all over the place. But I really care, and I want an actor to be their best. And therefore, whatever that actor needs, which is the great fun of directing, is trying to figure out what do they need to be 
relaxed? Do they need to have fun? Or do they need to be tense? Because there are a few who do. And certain scenes. What do you mean by that? They need to be Well, there are people who, with certain scene in front of them, want someone to be insulted and to be run really hard till they're exhausted because it gets them ready for that scene. Interesting. Interesting. I like that. And you'll serve whatever the situation is, yeah, I guess. Yeah. The but moment, if they need to the be. Moment. They need to be relaxed. That's true. Well, that's what I'm. That's what right. I'm getting. That's but a, they can be relaxed within the game. Have you ever had a situation, and you don't even have to give the name, where you just couldn't break through? The actor wasn't connecting with the scene, and it was just stopping everything in its tracks. How do you deal with that? That's a tough one. I have generally. I do find a way to break through. Do you? Excuse the crew, usually? It depends. Depends where you're at in that particular logjam. But it is something that does happen, usually because there's a fear and a communication problem. Also, some actors have a tough time reaching certain emotional places. And they may know they have to go there, but they may not have enough experience to understand how difficult it is. You began your directing career in documentaries, correct? Yes, I guess you could say that. Well, that's hard to say because I did start my directing career at RISD, where I went to school, which is Rhode Island School of Design. And I was directing, the first films were sort of visual puzzles or things about creating an atmosphere or creating um, a story, but it's a story of like plants coming out of winter or something like that. But then you always connected to the deeper I, I, I like stories. Yeah. 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 And I know you've been public about this, so I'll just say you had a terrible experience of a date rape when you were 16 years old. Yes, yes. And in fact, you memorialized that in a documentary. Movie. In a movie yes. that well, was a doc, what, right? Well, it's hard to call it a doc, but it's a... It's a fiction film inside of a doc. Well, whatever, however yeah. you characterize it, yeah. it got you a lot of attention. Yes, it did. It was different. And what, how did you leverage that experience to get to Hollywood? Well, that's a very odd connection because it isn't the obvious movie you'd bring to represent exactly. you in Hollywood. But it was the movie which got me a lot of attention. So I brought it and the others. But this one was different and people liked it because it was a story within a story. And it was kind of a very honest experience to go through, encouraging you also to talk about and your incredibly experience. authentic. Obviously. Yes, very authentic. And it was really interesting. I'm getting the movie ready to go. We're one day away from shooting. And I walk down the street and bump into my high school roommate, who was my roommate during the period that I'm making the film about. I bump into her. Oh, so we talk and I ask her if she's still acting because she had been. And she said, yes. And I said, well, do you think you'd like to play yourself in my movie? Which it was an odd, but she did. Do you keep in touch with her still? Vaguely. It's not so easy, but we both write. What was your first break in Hollywood? How did you finally lay your stake here, I guess? Well, are you talking about screenings and public, or are you talking about making films? Making films. Because when I came here... I I guess I don't understand the difference. Well, what it is is a movie that gets out to the public can bring you attention, and that can make a connection in Hollywood. And I think that's probably generally how it was. But because Not a Pretty Picture, which is what I named that film, is so different that not everybody considered having a person— Seeing the commercial— Yeah. For sort of talent come through. On yeah. the other hand, I was interviewed a number of times by Sean Daniels for Animal House. That would have been interesting. For To direct Animal House? hmm I wanted to. That but... is, I was about to talk next about your commitment to female-driven characters. <laughs> well, you see. <laughs> That's the epitome of male testosterone. I know. But you see, it's important to understand that we are ourselves and people are their gender 
in relationship to other people. And that's how you can really define yourself and other people. Is there a light motif to Martha Coolidge's films? Is there a theme throughout everything? Probably. Uh, do you know what it might be? <laughs> I you, don't know. I Not the money jobs. Yeah, Let's yeah, just say no. there are money jobs that we've all done in our lives. No, but all films, to me, if I don't see and understand what it's about, what it's trying to bring the audience, what it's trying to tell them— I I don't know if I can really direct it, but I like to know what's going on, you know. Uh, But I did things like Siren, which is the thing about the mermaids kind of attacking a a village in New England and stuff like that. You also just did it, this beautiful movie. I tested it as music and lyrics. It came out as, the name of it was? Oh, it's I'll Find You. I'll Find You. It's a it's love a, story. It's a love story set in the background of the Holocaust. And World War II. And World War II. And it was just beautifully done. Production was fraught with Well, the production the drama. had challenges. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we, we won't get into that, although I would love to, because that's a podcast in and of itself, isn't it? It is. It is. But I want to go back to early Hollywood. Yeah. Though. So your first big job, I suppose, or your commercial job was what? Oh, that's a good question. I suppose my first job was... Valley Girl? A Valley Girl wasn't a job. I did it in New York. I financed it. You did? Yeah. So was that your calling card more towards your I brought Valley career? Girl. I came with Valley Girl. I had to have Rambling Rose. It's almost an oxymoron. A Valley Girl done in New York. Was the term Valley Girl a term that was already established in the zeitgeist, or did you coin that? No, no. It it was established sort of because there was even one on Saturday Night Live. Oh. What I did do is I went into the Valley and met people at school, and I I sent all the actors there, and— they didn't say gag me with a, I mean, it was gag just. Gag me with a spoon. Yeah, it was, it was a Moon Zappa song. And we were tested for it. And in fact, we didn't have anybody say that phrase. But so many of those phrases became in the cultural. Yes, they did. And, oh, who picked it up, by the way? You, you financed it. But who actually, do you remember that? <laughs> yes. At that time, filmmakers had a whole way of being seen by having your films distributed by 16 millimeter distributors. So it was Films Inc., which was a very big what was one. It called? Films Inc. Films Inc. And you shot it in New York? Shot it m- mostly in New York. Went to places and stuff that were appropriate. And then the next kind of big break, I think, wasn't it Real Genius? Yes. Yes, because Brian Grazier saw my film, liked it, and wanted... Saw Valley Girl? He probably saw anything I made, but yes. I just interviewed him for my second book. Yeah. And uh, it was a great interview. We had fun together. So funny, Ron Howard and Brian just and Michael Rosenberg sent me a pipe, like a pipe that you smoke by a fireside chat, because I was invited to speak at their offsite. And they had a fireplace, a fake fireplace. And I said, I, if only I had my pipe. So uh, a couple of days later, you a messenger one. arrived and, with a pipe and said, uh, That's thank funny. you so much. You know, and I was very appreciative of that. So let's go into uh, when we first met, Ramblin' Rose. Now, rumor has it, this came from your mouth, that on the way to preview screenings, uh, you actually, your nerves tend to get the best of you. Oh, and God, you've yes. Had Three car accidents, three independent times going to previews. I did. Is that true? Yeah, maybe two. I don't know. And you refuse to drive yourself to a preview. So now I, the whole day, I don't drive. It's just silly. I'm nervous. I don't know. I feel terrible. Like, I feel like, do I induce or this process does? But It's just nerves. And when you're nervous, you're thinking about all these other things. Did I do this? Did I get this ready? Uh, You know, what's going to happen when they see this? And... You just run into something. What's it like for you when you go to your first test preview? Nobody has seen the movie. Yeah, tell yeah. us, tell the listeners well, what it's Well, it's very like. interesting. I I think the most fresh and easiest one to tell is Valley Girl because what we did is we just sent some people out on the street and pulled 35 people off the no street. No methodology, just sort no. of like whoever wants to come in, we're going to yeah, do Yeah, basically. Opinion. And they came 
and they really liked it, and it was a great screening. I was really happy with it. I learned a lot about humor, what kind of time you need on a joke and stuff like that, and it was great. It was great. So funny. You're, you're, you're one of those directors when I have given uh, notes from yeah. the audience – you really do listen. I mean, you really take it seriously. You don't dismiss it, but many might. And you, yeah, don't. that's why do you have disturbing. such a respect for the audience? Well, well, uh, I am an audience. Let's face it, and I definitely respect the audience. That's who I'm speaking to. The movie is made for them. I and love that. So it's very important that I then listen to them. And see where they get up and go to the bathroom. I mean, that's important. I know I've had this. I've mentioned this before on this podcast and other places that I had this discussion with Ang Lee when I when Ang said, you know, Pablo Picasso never tested his paintings. And I said, well, Pablo Picasso wasn't given a hundred million dollars to make his painting. And if he didn't like his product, he could put it in the back of his closet. Ah, uh, there don't get it to, is. And you don't no, get to do you that. don't get to do that. You have navigated very nicely between film and TV. And I'm very curious about something. You haven't run yeah. a show. You've never been a showrunner, but you have been invited to direct many different episodes yes. of many different shows. How do you pick up the style of a particular show? Is there a style guide, a style book that they keep? I've heard some do. How do you prepare for that? Well, I think what what I do is I just look at a lot of shows, mm. all the recent shows, and then the older shows too, and they'll create a style. It's usually obvious in the camera work or the mood or the lighting and the colors and all of that because the show has a certain attitude Let's take Sex in the City because uh, okay. I love that show and I know that show. You step on set. You have four women who have been working together. Kristen Davis and I, by the way, went to school together. But you have four women who you don't really know, I imagine. Not yet. And exactly. You're walking in as the stranger. Are they embracing of you? Do they want to support you? Or It's got to be nerve-wracking. Well, that, Kevin, is one of the big tests. And this is why... On a movie, you have a bigger chance because you are there in prep longer and they come and have rehearsal time. But you don't get that in TV after all. Plus, you're all meeting each other for the first, first time. time. That's the problem. You're not hanging out with them and, and trying out the scenes and stuff. And that's a problem. So one thing that I do is I try to get to know them as best I can. I get to know their work so I look at their work and I can come in and talk to them about it if they want to talk about it very rarely. And I think that I need to have an approach because I think that I've seen a certain acting issue or certain behavioral things and I just need an approach for me. It's a secret with me. <laughs> and that helps me a lot. I'll go days early in the makeup trailer and chit chat, get to know them. Oh, that's, that's really good. smart. It's yeah. good. I and mean, also, you've got a crew that is also very cohesive. And then very. you probably feel, how am I being compared to the director last week? Well, that's true. It, it isn't that I necessarily worry about that, but I do worry about what it's usually like because shows do have an attitude toward the directors. The crew has an attitude, usually. What do you love about directing? Oh, my God. I love everything about it. It's a complex undertaking. It's because to do a created complex story, which is what real stories are, you have many layers. You have layers of background of emotional growth and development. You have friendships and relationships, which are very strong and dictate people's personalities in a way. And I love figuring out how I'm going to let certain clues out and how we're going to reveal certain things without making them obvious. 
because once you get involved in any kind of mystery, murder mystery, whatever, right. you have to understand what kind of a clue it is. And you don't want it being too obvious. Do you have a preference between the prep, production, or post? Oh, God. That's a hard one. I love production. You love production. being on a set? and Yeah, I love production. Do you prepare a lot before night before and do you have yes do you have a storyboard <laughs> often but clearly you come in with a shot list that you yes are. often i make a shot list because what i find is the shot list all the way through prep helps you and even if you don't shoot that shot list because things could happen it could rain you could things could happen but the point is it tells you how much you need Mm. What kind of a scene are you trying to do? Mm. Is it going to have a lot of shots or no shots? It does help you and the AD who's making the schedule know what you have in mind. And clearly, my favorite is the post-production process, which makes sense with what I do. Yeah, you know? and post-production <clears throat> is great, too. And it's great because that's where you really make the movie. I mean, you do make the movie several times. You do make the movie. I love that. I'm going <laughs> to use that. You do make the movie several times. Yes, you have you it do. in the script. Then yep. you are making it with you People. have no idea. Right. You yeah. have no idea. And then you're on in post and you're putting the scenes together. But that changes, too. You can completely change scenes and how the movie plays if you recut it. It's fascinating to me. Going back to the screening process, uh, I want to just ask you, is there a memorable moment that you've had when you finally bring your movie to that audience and you said, wow, that comment is amazing and you've made a significant change as a result? Anything that comes to mind? Well, I, I can't remember, maybe I will, uh, a change that I made, but I do remember how, what it feels like when you take your movie to a real audience. Mm -hmm. It could be the test or it could be in a theater. And all of a sudden, they're laughing. You hear laughs and reactions that are spontaneous and they're for the movie and they're fresh and they're stimulating. Sean Levy says it's sort of like a wash that bathes over you. Well, it's true. That's true. And the thing is, is that if you have that, it's a wonderful thing. And by the way, every audience is different. They're really different. You can go to a different kind of neighborhood, have a completely different reaction. Which is absolutely true, which is why we do. With the new kind of yeah. screening formats that was we invented during COVID called Virtue Works, and that's like a way to see the audience watching your movie you get to watch the audience watching your movie oh, online okay in real time the sample is from all over the united states as opposed to being in long beach or yeah. in burbank got or it in okay County. so that gives you a really good sense of various opinions but it's amazing to me how opinions are so homogenized now like because of social media people in oklahoma could be uh, speaking about the same thing of people in Atlanta and oh, yeah. Albany and Poughkeepsie and wherever else you may be. I'm going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk horses. Ah! Back in a moment. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never-before-revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster, available now. We're back with Martha Coolidge, who is one of my dear friends, and I am so grateful to have gone out with her to her ranch early on. She has had several ranches over the years. Martha, you are known for your love of Pasifino horses. <laughs> I'd love to, and I would feel remiss if I didn't bring up, your devotion to these marvelous animals. And as a, a male rider, I have to say I appreciate 
the Pasifino's gate. <laughs> ah, yes, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. You know, it's so funny because I'd always wanted a horse, and it was my mother who said to me, I don't know why you don't have a horse. You could afford a horse now. You could. And suddenly I thought, she's right. What am I doing? And I went and started looking around, and it was Gail Hurd who got me into Pasofino. She had quite a few. I didn't know it was Gail because, remember, you and Gail and I went riding together. Yeah. That was fun as heck. It yeah, was, was really, really fun. really great. And it was Gail because she was selling her, one of her ex-husband's horses. <laughs> and I got that horse, and it was great introductory horse. She was a great horse. And then I'm one of those people. Did you have the grounds for it then? Yeah, well, I kept it where it lived. Ah, got it. So it didn't. Yeah. you didn't move it to your property. No, I didn't. And ultimately, you moved to the yes. horse's property. Yes, yes, yes. But it was great. But and you showed horses. I How, showed. Uh, you sold horses. Yeah. How many did you have at the height of your... Well, sort of... I owned, with my partners, probably 60. I'm just guessing. I was going to say 40, if I remember. Yeah, no. 60 horses. Wow. But... I was selling, and when you sell, you usually you're selling one at a time. So you concentrate on a few, and then when they go, you can concentrate on another one. And also, often they're untrained and young, so you're working on training them with your trainer. And they're great horse. They're very friendly. They're gated, which is means it's a natural four beat gait where the horse is moving and smooth. So, as I said... You're not boing, 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 uh, bouncing. uh, uh, Exactly. And as a sort of a novice rider, (laughs) many people don't know this. I'm just going to share it. You know it. But I learned to ride horses when I was an actor, and I had a Wrangler jeans contract for three years, and I had to learn how to ride horses. Oh, God, you're not the only and person with a sudden learning It was, problem. and I fell in love with it. Yeah. I just, I loved it. And we went to great locations to shoot, to Moab, Utah. Oh, I bet you and did. To, oh. Even out in Santa Clarita. Out oh, there, yeah. Because you know, you you had your ranches were also full, yeah, out, out in the there. valley. Yeah. yeah. You know, Martha... You have such a love for the animals. I love animals. You showed them, right? You used to go to shows. Yep. It makes you a better person, a better writer, and you have a lot of experiences that are fun. You also give the adage, get back on the horse again, uh, a new uh, definition. (laughs) I guess it was about five or so years ago, you fell off a horse and had a terrible accident and recovered beautifully from it. But that was a really scary thing. It was. It was a particularly emotional time for me. And I'm sure that's why it happened at that time. And the horse, apparently, it was a youngish horse and the saddle broke. Oh, I thought it was a snake or something. No, the saddle broke, and this horse was not ready for that. I know it was a long recovery because you were in the hospital, and I, we visited you. And, yes. And, uh, with my doggy. Yes. With, with Kugel at the time. Yes. My Labradoodle. Listen, it was touch and go for a little bit, and the fact that you came back as strong as you did and yes. as capable as you are is just fantastic. So for those listening... If you fall off the horse, get back on. Get back on. Why not? And Martha did. I want to move to an area that is very near and dear to you, which is women Ah. in film. Mm. And the fact that you were the first woman president of Of the the, Director's Guild. Yeah, Director's Guild. What was that like for you when you got that office? You know, it was great. I enjoyed it because when I first went there, it was actually one of the men who'd been president. And he just said, you know, you're going to be president someday. And- That was like, we're filmmakers. I'd never been in a corporate structure where they groom you for this or that. And it was great. I felt good about that. The only thing that was funny was there were some people who were not ready for that, to have a woman president. So it was was, early 2000? Yeah. 2001, right? Yeah. I think I said, yeah. So it was sort of a challenge for some people, although most people, it was very fun. And when I was elected, some guy in Rasta hair and all this came up and hugged me and said, you don't know how glad we are that you're president. And that was great. I felt good. There's people in the guild who identify with certain groups and... Or underrepresented groups. Yeah, underrepresented. Let's uh, let's talk the truth here. 
what is going on with the business right now? Ah. I really want to get your perspective. How did we get here and where are things going? Well, where they're going is anybody's guess. We can't completely predict it. But one thing is for sure, distribution has changed, how people get their films out, how they get discovered, what they can do. A short film can be made by a person quite professionally on their own and then distributed on YouTube and get out there and be seen. So it does happen, and it's changed everything. Also, how people's films are being seen and ranked. You have to include that place. Why in 2023 are we still having these massive discussions about (laughs) such lack of female-represented directors? I mean, is there a theory that you have about why women are not in that seat? Yes, it has to be something from the culture. It has to be. Because when I've done studies, yeah, people don't care who's directed. No, they don't. They don't. There's a few sort of a cadre, a small cadre of directors that do help a Christopher Nolan, yeah. a Jim Cameron, a Steven Spielberg, a Ron Howard. They have a kind of commercial appeal that can help a movie. Yes. But by and large, when you have a superhero movie, for example... People don't care who directed it. Why are there not more Beca- women that okay. have, are behind well, all of these? Uh, given what some of the people have said to me is that they want or believe, the financiers, that the director has to be able to take control of all this money and all that machismo, which is in those kinds of movies, and be a winner with it. And that they don't imagine a woman. They don't see the woman I could see, see that 20 there. years ago. I don't see that happening now. You I, would think. I really don't. I mean, first of all, I do see change because I work on yeah. nearly 60, 70 percent of every yeah. movie oh, God. that tests in Hollywood. So I get to see who's directing. And I'm seeing some very wonderful directorial work by women who, given that opportunity, once given it, Yes. Really turn it out. Yeah, that's right. So why why wouldn't we be that way since we're like that in many And careers. I'm talking about full on testosterone driven yeah, if you want to go absolutely. there. Absolutely. So I just think it's a legacy thing and I just think it's a slow one to turn. And I heard a stat that a lot of female directors enter film school, you know, like want to be film directors, but graduate not as wanting that. Yes, that's right. Because as a teacher at Chapman and other places that you've taught You sense that as well, huh? Well, I think what it is is that the media says there are no jobs for women. I mean, they bring that out. They keep having that up. And girls will say to me, I want to go into some area where there's actually work for me. That's a fair comment. You know, and that's a fair comment. And it's sad. And it does make entering into one of these careers even more tricky because why would you go into a career where you can't get a job? I was also thinking that had something to do, and this may be archaic as well, uh, motherhood. When you are directing a movie, you must show up on set every day. And if you happen to want to have a child or are pregnant during that period, it's going to be really challenging in your ninth month or eight and a half months. Yeah. I'm wondering if that has some kind of even small effect. Now, you have a child, Preston. Never thought about it, actually, whether I should or shouldn't do it. But what I'm wondering is I would love to talk to someone who was that pregnant and directing. Because usually Mm -hmm. directing Mm -hmm. comes in rather big sections of time. Sure. So generally, in my case, I just never had a chance to direct pregnant I did when I did commercial, but not exactly. doing a feature film. Feature film. For but your... I could, and I would, but it was... It's a catch-22, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is a catch-22. It is, and it's what people think of you. But here's the other thing. There is a glamorous thing in our society where we think of the young boy wonder director who shows up and makes this thing into a giant hit sort of in the Steven Spielberg mold. And I don't know if we have that about women at all. I feel that way also about young stars. Like 
what are we doing to promote? Yeah. Or Mm -hmm. I don't think it's something we're doing, actually. What I think is happening, though, is the nature of the way movies are done now and seen and there's so many of them seen yes, on streamers there are that we're not adding to this mystique of like who are the new movie stars and that is know. a question i ask myself every day <laughs> you know and that's only because it's important to us because all the people in distribution want us to have stars in our movies and they can be tricky to get because they may not want to be in a underfinanced little independent movie, but it is something that's required or needed. And I don't know. One thing that happens is if you have a certain age group in your movie, then you start to get to know all the actors in that age group. And it's true. There's lots of surprises. It's one of my theories about why romantic comedies have had such a struggle in the theaters is because the only one that sort of worked in recent memory was Julia Roberts and George Clooney. Yes, that was a wild. Yeah. And then you can argue that Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum had Lost City, but that really was more of an adventure. Yeah. But the idea, though, is those are tried and true. They're stars and personalities that we sort of embrace. That I keep asking see. myself, but it's partly because what do people do to flirt? I know. Are we seeing flirting done in our culture? Netflix and chill. Yeah. Is the vernacular for a lot of young people, you know, we'll come back, watch a movie and stay in. Yeah. It's really an interesting cultural sort of It is a very big change. And I've wondered this, having been teaching at mostly grad students and undergrad students, you know, you do get to watch them and see them and see what the interaction is like. Are you hopeful for the future? I'm always hopeful for the future. Are there any filmmakers that you have your, that oh, you have your eye on? Oh, God, yes. I who, think who you, there's some you, great who you, ones. Who do you think is somebody that you, if you could see them right here, you'd say, yeah. I really respect what oh, you Oh, there's so many, though. I can't even... Was there a movie last year that you particularly yes, loved? Yes, I like a lot of movies, but... No, I didn't say liked. No, uh, love. was there a actually. movie that you loved? Loved. I do love a lot of movies. and I loved the movie RRR. I never saw it. Oh, that was, I think, one of my favorite okay, movies. Okay, I have to see it. It was it. just, to me, the sheer entertainment value of that. And India did not submit it as their official submission. Yeah, so it, I know. It wasn't nominated for anything except song, which it won. It was apparently made over like a two or three year period. And it's so epic. There's an intermission. It's crazy. But it's like Crouching Tiger meets like Rush Hour meets sort of True Lies and the level of action. It's just crazy. So I really, really, really like that and love that, actually. Yeah. But love is is the metric that now I'm sort of pushing as many clients that will allow me to because like is so passive and love cuts through noise. Well, love does have to be in there because a person to make a connection with a character in a movie has to have some kind of love or compassion or identity with that person's problems in that movie. And we see a lot of movies that are not that happy, but they are loved. And that's a very important part of it. Absolutely. That movie I mentioned did have pure entertainment yeah. value, but there's plenty of movies that end tragically that I love, Yeah, you know, for various reasons. There's another theory about the lack of stars. Before we get off that, I just want to say that, and it just came to my attention and it makes total sense. In this world where everyone has the 2 million, 5 million, 50 million followers, there's no mystery anymore. It's like you know yeah. everything about these folks. So it's like, you know, we used to have sort of a veil of, That's of mystery. And so when you saw the Academy Awards, for example, it was seeing these people who maybe you didn't see except for one movie that year. You That's knew nothing right. about them. And now you're seeing their vulnerability perhaps come out. But now you're, you're almost expecting these things, you know, because you know them so well. They feel like friends and neighbors. Yeah, that's true. And I think that is also part of the surprise of new movies coming out with from new directors and new filmmakers is that there are so many things that are in movies that really do surprise you. And they can be particularly personal to you, but they are a surprise to show up in a movie because they never have before. Mm, and yes, that yes, is yeah. 
a big thing. It's part of what living is, is that you face challenges that you didn't know were there. What would you like to direct right now if you could? Ah, what's what's exciting to you? You know, one, one of the things for a director is that you have something you really want to do. You want to a do A passion them, project. Yeah, for a long sort. time. And I have several films like that. For example, okay, let's just talk genre. I love sci-fi. Oh. So sci-fi to me is great. But I also would like to do a Western. And I know it Ooh. must be very challenging with all the dust and the horses. No, and the, but what but about the Yellowstone not? success and the whole Taylor Sheridan universe Absolutely. right now? Are you kidding? It's the best it's time It's amazing. Ever. Yeah, it is. So anyone listening, uh, if you want a good Western, yeah, from me. Call, call Martha Coolidge <laughs> and, and she will, uh, she'll show up uh, on, that, on that front. And... I would uh, I wouldn't touch a western if I didn't have a director who could work with horses. Oh yeah, quite frankly. But also, it's with <laughs> and people. And so you, you you bring all of those things to the table. And there's different cultures happening. One of the things that is so great about westerns, in particular, are all the cultures that mm, are involved. Yes, yes. You have Native American culture mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and various tribes. And then you have the people coming over from different countries and the reasons they came and criminals came and all kinds of people came. And it is fascinating when you think you go to a town and what kind of people went there in the gold rush, what kind of people went there to farm. You know, it's just... It is. And could we ever do... I can't imagine ever me doing it. I can't. I mean, I can imagine, yes. (laughs) So, Martha, before we break, I did want to ask you a question that I've asked several directors. What's your superpower Uh, as a director? Well, I would say that my superpower is that I am good at going into complex situations. So I like to do a complex prep have many relationships with people that I'm juggling, and I stay very calm in crisis. And it makes me think creatively and be productive. And that's something that I really like. I like to see it in me coming out. I do. And I've seen it in all of your movies. Ah. Whether it's something light fair, like Out to Sea or Prince and Me, and whether it's really more deeply expressed in a Dorothy Danbridge or a Ramblin' Rose. You know, it's really exciting to see. You are such a treasure to our industry and really a legend and a pioneer in film and particularly for women in film. And we thank you. I thank you. And I'm so proud to be your friend and continue to and you amaze me. Well, thank you, Kevin, and you do me too, because you've walked into this business and just, along with a few other people, but turned this whole testing thing into a huge enterprise worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Martha, it has been such a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for joining the show. And to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed our interview. I encourage you to check out Martha's body of work. For stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or through my website at kevingets360.com. You can also follow me on my social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, I will welcome television and film producer and CEO of the creative management company, The Gotham Group, Ellen Goldsmith Vane. Until next time, I'm Kevin Getz. And to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.